let's turn tonight. I've got Hosea 6 up on the screen, but I want you to turn there if you want to. And then Genesis chapter 12, if you would please. And I'm going to go in a certain direction the next few Wednesday nights. We've been sort of learning doctrine. We've went through the doctrine of who God is who Jesus is, who the Holy Spirit is, is the Bible right? We talked about doctrine of salvation. And let me deal with, um, for a few weeks, uh, what the Bible says about the Jews, okay? And, and, I'm, and I'm going to be fair about it, as the Bible is fair. God says things to the Jews that the Jews have to listen to because they were God's people they weren't always right and so I'm going to be very fair about it but I will say this I will never allow this church to curse the Jews it will never happen and that doctrine has been challenged before not too long ago and uh, somebody who thought that they were smarter than the Bible, smarter than God, because they had listened and read a lot of books. And they said, we've replaced Israel. I said, no, you don't replace Israel. And you got to be careful. Now, I'm going to say, in fact, we're, after we get done in Genesis 12, we're going to go, I've been talking about this the last couple days, we're going to go to Acts chapter 7, and we're going to let Stephen say what's on Stephen's mind before they killed him. But I believe that God made promises to Abraham and to Abraham's seed, and no, I don't believe God breaks those promises. If God breaks his promise to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 sons of Jacob, if God breaks his promise to them, what does that say about his promise to us? Okay? And many of the things that God said to Israel were unconditional promises it was not based upon how good they were it was based upon the fact that God loved them and so we'll touch on that uh, for a few weeks let's start in uh, let's let me just go to Genesis 12 there on the screen we'll read this and we'll go to prayer we got several things uh, on our prayer request list uh, pray for sister Lori um, who uh, she's the lady that came to homecoming last year in the wheelchair she's in the hospital Correct, Rose? And um, she's asking us to pray for her tonight. She's got some things going on. Don't know if she had a stroke or not. So pray for her, all right? And we'll mention some other names here shortly. Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, this is Abram, not Abraham, and there's a reason why. God's going to change. In fact, John, what I was telling you today about the number 5. How far is it from Genesis 12 to Genesis 17? It's five chapters. I'm telling you, God does everything in order, perfect order. When you understand that order, you'll go, there it is again. And he's going to make a, an unconditional promise to Abram. And the difference between Abram and Abraham is think of the difference, Sterling, before you got saved and after you got saved. Okay, before you got saved, there were things that you were doing in your life that were wrong. And when God saved you, all of a sudden now, those things, you're, you're reading the Bible and you're seeing those things are not right. And then we're not going to do those things anymore. Okay, I know a little bit about Sterling's past and know that God made a change in that man's life. Okay, but here God makes a promise not to Abraham, but to Abram. He makes it before he changes him. And look at what he said. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will shew thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I want you to think about this. The three largest religions in the world Judaism Christianity and Islam stem from Abraham 
Now, one of them's way off because it takes, takes the lineage of Abraham through Ishmael and says that that's God's chosen people, but it's not, okay? But that's, he meant what he said. The three biggest religions in the world are Abrahamic religions. They're based upon Abraham, not Buddha or not Confucius or anything like that. You understand the difference? So in verse 4, uh, verse 3 again, I will bless, th this, this is important. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. It is an unconditional promise. And that promise, by the way, since God is still God and he doesn't change, that promise is still in effect. Where's Adolf Hitler right now? He's in hell. Did he lose his war? Yes. Why? He went against God's people. Okay? Now, whatever his reasons were, he may have been right about the politics of the German Jews during the Third Reich. They were very leftist leaning. And uh, I, in fact, Roy, uh, Roy, I talked to your nephew, Al. He knows a lot of Jews in Washington, D.C. And you know what he says? He says, I don't understand him. He said, because primarily they are, they always vote liberal Democrat, and it's the Democrats who do everything they can to not help the nation of Israel. And he said, I don't understand it. I don't understand why their politics are geared toward the people in this country who would turn their back on Israel. He said, I don't understand it. But he said, I love them and I pray for them. That came from Al to me, all right? So anyway, this, this promise that God made, you do not curse Israel. And, and one of the biggest ways Israel is cursed is by replacing the promise that God made or taking the promises that God made to them and applying them to somebody else besides who they are. When you think about it, the Mormon religion replaces Israel. The Mormons teach that they are the lost tribes of Israel that God has restored with a new gospel. Jehovah's Witness, what do they believe? They believe that they're the 144,000. That's Israel. So Judaism, uh, or excuse me, not Judaism, but Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, the Catholic Church does the same thing, that they're Israel, okay? They curse Israel, and God has a curse on them. So now verse 4. So Abraham de Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth into the land of Canaan, into the land of Canaan they came. And the big picture of this is God is... This is a picture of God taking his people out of their homeland and giving them their new homeland. That's what this is about, all right? Let's go to prayer. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. Thank you, dear God, for all of these that are here tonight, those that are attending online. And I pray, dear God, I know, Father, that when I post these messages, there's going to be some people who are going to scream bloody murder against Israel. They're going to curse the Jews. They're going to accuse them of all kinds of things. And Father, many of those things might be true. But Father, Jesus told us to love our enemies. One thing I know about the Jews, they are an enemy to the cross. They hated Jesus. They still do. And they work against the salvation of the cross on every turn. But I love them. Because you've grafted us in to their kingdom. And Father, I believe, Lord, that you will yet graft them in again when they believe. Father, bless Israel. Let this church be a blessing to the people of God through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And bless our study of your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said... All right, now, with all of that in mind now, turn to, turn to Acts chapter 12, no, Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Um, 
Several years ago, I just went through the book of Acts, and I noticed something, that there was one particular group, as the church is forming, the Holy Ghost is moving, God is saving people, God is calling up apostles, He's calling bishops, He's calling preachers and evangelists and prophets. God is adding to the church daily such as should be saved. And the only people in the whole book of Acts who had a big problem with that church wasn't the Romans, wasn't the Greeks, it was the Jews. Consistently through the book of Acts, the greatest enemies to the preaching of Jesus Christ came from the Jews. And the Jews knew that they were under Roman rule and they knew that they couldn't necessarily act on their hatred toward the Christians without Roman approval. So they, you'll, what you'll see if you read through the book of Acts, you'll see the Jews constantly appealing to, they went to, they, in the Gospels, they went to Pontius Pilate, said, kill that Jesus, get rid of him, he's a bad guy. We don't, he's, he's, uh, treasonous against Rome. They were lying through their teeth. They had nothing on him. And they were doing the same thing all throughout the book of Acts. And they hated the apostle Paul. They hated him. And what I see now in the Hebrew roots movement, I have no doubt in my mind that the Hebrew roots movement is a movement started by Jewish rabbis who have influenced people who may have at one point come to Jesus and tried to learn about salvation, but quickly they were led astray by Jewish rabbis telling them that the real Messiah wasn't the Messiah that Paul preached. And I have read the statements of some of these Hebrew roots people who said that Paul was a false apostle and should not be listened to it. I had a lady write me an email. She said, Pastor Mike, I've, I've read the Bible and I've come to the conclusion Paul was a fake apostle. And I went, you, weren't re you didn't read the Bible and get that. You read websites, you listened to YouTube videos that told you that, but you didn't come up with that by reading the scriptures. And I showed her in the book of 2 Peter where Peter said, uh, go read Paul. Go get your doctrine and understanding from Paul. Paul knew who Jesus was. He knew the mystery, he understood it. Some things are hard, hard to understand, Peter said, but he said, read Paul. And uh, so I sent that to her. But anyway... So here is Stephen in uh, Acts chapter 6 and 7. Acts chapter 6 is where uh, they call the deacons, the office of the deacon. Stephen was the first name that came up and they chose seven men. They laid hands on them. They said they, these are going to be ministers uh, for the poor and for the needs of the church and so on. It's not meet that we, the apostles, should leave the word of God to go serve tables. So let's raise up the office of deacon. And they, and they made these men deacons. They ordained them. And these men did great things. And Stephen takes off running. And everything that Stephen doing is doing, God is blessing him. God is healing people. God is, uh, uh, Stephen is preaching and people are being saved. And the Jews take notice and they call him in. And remember what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, they're going to bring you in before councils and before synagogues. And they're going to question you on what you're preaching. And Jesus told them, don't worry about what you're going to say. I'm going to put words in your mouth. And that happened right here in Acts chapter 7. Because Stephen is standing before the Jewish council. Being examined about why he's preaching Jesus. And Stephen doesn't say, hey, we all worship the same God. Let's all try to find common ground. He didn't say that. He let those guys have it. Let's look at Acts chapter 7. Then said the high priest, are these things so? And he, being Stephen, verse 2 said, men and brethren and fathers. Stephen was a Jew. And he said, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto who? Our father Abraham. When he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in 
Charon, which is Haran. And he said unto him, get thee out of thy country. That We just read that in Acts chapter 12. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I will shew thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Charon or Haran. And from, because you know, the Jews, when they have an H, it's sort of a ch, okay, Haran. So that's why it's spelled that way. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. Stephen's about to unload. And he said, he gave him none inheritance in it. No, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him. When as yet he had no child. And God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage, will I judge, said God, and after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. Here's what, you got to understand what Stephen's doing. Everything he's saying is by the Holy Ghost, and everything he's saying is true. But what he, he's not just telling what happened in the past? Stephen is also prophesying of what is going to happen in the future. And you know what he's saying to these Jewish men? Guess what, guys? The same God who did that for our forefathers took them out of bondage and brought them into a land of promise. God's going to do that again with his people, Israel. He's going to do it again. So then he said, verse 8, And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac, circumcised him the eighth day. Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with them. Now Stephen is getting to dig into these guys. Because guess who Joseph represents? Jesus. And he said, our twelve forefathers, our patriarch brothers, hated the one that God had chosen to be their savior. They hated him and was envious against him, but God was with him. Stephen is looking these guys right in the eyes. And then he says in verse 10, and delivered him out of all of his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now there came a dearth all over the land of Egypt and Canaan and great affliction and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. Do you know what he's saying here? Guess who Egypt represents? The Gentiles. Us. You know what he's saying? The Gentiles have the corn, the food, the word of God. And to think that the Jews are going to have to come to the Gentiles for their salvation and for their bread, for their doctrine, for Christ. Jews don't turn to Gentiles for help. They would rather die than to ask a Gentile to help them. This is what he's getting at to them. Okay. Then it says, uh, verse 13, and, this, and at the second time Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Sikkim and laid him in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Sikkim. That's in Genesis 23. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred and evil entreated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end that they might not live. He's telling them the enemy came after our people and tried to kill us all. And then he said, Verse 20, in which time Moses was born, he was exceeding fair. Guess who Moses is? It's Jesus. 
He was exceeding Pharaoh and nursed up in his father's house three months and he was cast out. Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nursed him for her own son. Guess where Jesus is again? In this story, Jesus is once again with the Egyptians, the Gentiles. Who is it in this world that still worships Jesus Christ? Not the Jews, the Gentiles. Okay? So, and remember the story where Moses saw the Egyptians or an Egyptian man um, harming the Jews and Moses went after him and killed him? And Moses thought, surely my own brethren will say, Moses, thank you for standing up for us. But what did they do? They said, what, are you going to kill us too? Get out of here. So guess what that was all about? Look at your Bible. Verse 22, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, there's a number. It's going to have something to do with the gospel. And it came to his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. This is about Jesus coming the first time. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed, listen now, he is supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. But he understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do you wrong one another? Here's Jesus coming to his own people, and the Bible says his own received him not. He's their Messiah. He's their Prince. He's their Savior. And yet they hate him. They despised him. So, um, what verse was I in? Huh? 26, okay, so now 27. But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying, and he was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. Two is always a number for the Gentile age, 2,000 years, two days, two witnesses, the Old and New Testament, that's what that represents. And when 40 years... Works. But by the way, you can divide Moses' life up into three divisions of 40 years. First 40 years, he's in Egypt. He kills the Egyptian. He gets sent away. 40 years more, he's in, uh, he marries and has two sons. And then after that 40 years, God calls him and says, go set my people free. Moses then goes and gets his people. And then 40 years later, he dies on top of uh, whatever mountain that was. Huh? Horeb, I think. In the book of Deuteronomy, 120 years old. But anyway, uh, man, I'm like, I'm getting so excited. I'm getting ahead of myself. But look at verse uh, uh, and verse 30. And when 40 years were expired, there appeared unto him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, an angel and the Lord in a flame of fire and a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. And as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I'm the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, put off thy shoes from thy feet for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I've heard their groaning and, and, um, and am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. Where's Moses going again? Into, where's the savior at? It's back in Egypt. And didn't God say out of Egypt, will I call my son? And when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, what did the Lord tell Joseph to do? Take him to Egypt. So now Jesus is in Egypt again. You get that? He's with the Gentiles, not the Jews. Okay. And then it looked at verse uh, 35. This Moses whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. And he brought them out after they had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. Did Jesus do miracles and signs among the Jews? Yes. He healed them. He delivered them. He raised people from the dead. And they saw it. This, then verse 37, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. Now remember, Stephen is saying this to these learned Jewish men. They're not ignorant about what it, what it says in the Old Testament. They know it. 
And Stephen is trying to convince them that all of these stories were prophecies of Jesus coming to his people. And he's setting them up because he's fixing to say, every time God sent you a savior, you killed him. Every time. During the judge system, when the judges were supposed to rule over Israel, starting from Moses, Samuel was the last one. And they had all those judges in the book of, uh, in the book of Judges. And you remember in Samuel's day what Israel said? We don't want judges anymore. We want a king. They got rid of their judicial system wherewith God would have made them free and he put them in bondage under a cruel king by the name of Saul. But anyway, verse 38, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness. By the way, I believe that. People say, oh, the church wasn't in the Old Testament. Well, read verse 38 again. That was the congregation, the church in the wilderness with the angel, which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt. Look at this. Every time God sent them a savior, they rejected him. They hated him. They thrust him away and they said, we're going to go back into bondage. Verse 40, saying unto Aaron, make us gods to go before us. And for is this Moses, which brought us of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and received and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. O ye house of Israel, ye have offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years. In the, there's another 40 years. In the wilderness. Yea, you took up the tabernacle of Molech, the star of your god Remphan, figures which you made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. God, and they, he's saying this to those men, saying you're fixing to be in bondage again because you rejected your Savior. Our fathers, verse 44, had the tabernacle of, wil of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, uh, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. How be it? The Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. And he's saying this to the Jews who believe that because they had the temple, God was going to be with them. And I mean, Stephen, if you're a Jewish scholar and you're sitting there hearing Stephen say all this, your blood is boiling now because you know what he's saying. Now, verse 49, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. And what house will you build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hands made all these things? Now, Stephen really cuts loose on them. And he's just basically given them the entire Old Testament in a condensed version. And everything that he said to them was really about Jesus and them rejecting him. And then he says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. And I submit to you tonight that the Jews still reject the Holy Ghost. Roy, I, and I said this to Al. Al, you got to understand, and you know this, the Jews always rejected God trying to save them. And Al, Al's right. You show me a conservative Jew. There's one every now and then. But one of the things that Hitler hated about the Jews in Germany was that they were all Marxist communist. And Hitler, believe it or not, hated communism even though he became a dictator, okay? But he hated the Jews for that. And to this day in this nation, for the most part, most Jews despise conservative 
Christians in this country standing up for the state of Israel. They hate it that the Gentiles are more for their homeland than even they are. And this is what Stephen's telling them. Verse 52, he said, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted and have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one of whom you have uh, been now both the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. And I believe that. I believe these men had devils in them that were beast devils. And I believe they were going, <laughs> kind of like that. And then it says, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Now you listen to me. And I'm speaking, I'm speaking a lot to the choir, but I'm going to speak to all those people who are going to leave comments on this YouTube video. Because you've read so much anti-Jewish material. You've watched so much anti-Jewish videos on YouTube. And you've got it in your mind that God hates the Jews, that they are New World Order conspiracy people, and I believe they are. I believe it. I've seen their, um, what is that, the Supreme Court House in, in uh, the land of Israel right now. It is full of occult symbols, full of it. Built by the Rothschilds, okay? So it's true. Is there an international Jewish conspiracy? You bet there is. And I'm telling you to this day, the people who work the hardest against the gospel that we teach are the Jews. So, should we rise up indignantly and say, well, they're against Jesus, so we're against them. Let me show you what Stephen did. And maybe that'll change your mind. In verse 56, Stephen said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they, all oh, that got them. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. They literally did this. So they couldn't hear Stephen say that. And, and ran upon him with one accord. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. We know who that is. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Stephen is calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Not the Jews. Yet. In verse four, look at verse 60. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge and when he had said this he fell asleep now remember what jesus said when he was on the cross to all the people that had nailed him to that cross what did he say father forgive them for they know not what they do and jesus said it to the jews not the roman soldiers the jews See, when Jesus comes back, the Bible says, every eye shall see him and they that pierced him, Israel. And now here's Stephen, same situation. The Jews hate him. They're going to kill him because they killed their own prophets. They killed Jesus. And they're killing Stephen. And yet Stephen says to God, God, do not hold this against them. Don't condemn them for doing this. Did Stephen love the Jews? Yeah. And when you love somebody, no matter what they do, you'll forgive them. Amen? 
So you don't even have to ask me the question, Pastor Mike, do you believe that God's going to restore the Jewish people? Yes. But they're evil. They're working again. They're building a new world order. Yeah, I know. They're worshiping false gods. Yeah, I know. I mean, I've studied the Kabbalah. I know a lot about their teachings. And they are worshiping the Antichrist. Plain and simple. But remember, they asked Moses to put a veil over his face because he had been with God and his face was shining so bright and they couldn't stand to look upon him. And Paul said, I know what that means. Every time they read the Old Testament, it's veiled. It's not revealed to them. It's hidden. It's covered up. Their own lawgiver, Moses, was hard of speech, meaning they couldn't understand what he was saying. And God did that on a purpose. He did it. He had a reason for it. Same reason why on the day of Pentecost, as the Holy Ghost is poured out, exactly the way God told the Jewish prophets. I mean, how many men who write the Old Testament were Gentiles? None of them. All of them Jews. New Testament. I kind of think Luke was a Gentile. I could be wrong. He wrote two books of the Bible, Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. But the rest of them, Matthew, Mark, John, Peter, James, Paul, they were all Jews. Who did God pick? The Jews. Who does God love? The Jews. When Joseph was sold into slavery, they, he knew they were going to kill him. They sold him into slavery. If anybody had a reason to hate their own brothers, it would have been Joseph. But when he, his brothers come to him, does he have them slaughtered? No. What does he do? He becomes their savior. And he says, don't worry about it, because what you meant to me for evil, God meant to you for good, to save you. God sent me ahead of you to save you. And he forgave every one of them for what they did. And he's going to do that again. Amen. 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 So all of these conspiracy theories that are on the internet, and even before the internet, there were books being written by men around the world. Every nation that's had Jews in them has hated them. It wasn't just Germany. Spain hated their Jews. The Dutch hated the Jews. The British hated the Jews. Okay? The Germans hated them. Everybody hates them. The Muslims hate them and want them destroyed. And then you've got Americans who want them killed, want them destroyed. Why are we sending all this money to Israel? Why is that one nation? And here's what I haven't figured out. Every Middle Eastern nation is rich from what? Oil. Except one nation. Israel. They don't have any oil. They have no oil. And yet there they are back in that land again that God swore to their forefathers. There they are back in the land again. Okay? God's, God's not done with them. He's going to keep his promise. Let's look in Hebrews chapter 11. Turn there. And then, I mean, if you, can, if you want to continue in the book of Acts and do your own study, just, just read through it and pick out the number of times that the Jews tried to get at the, the Christians and the preachers and the prophets and the apostles and how many times they tried to kill Paul. Every time they tried to kill Paul. Every time. And they finally, the last time they succeeded. But it was the Jews. It was always the Jews. So I believe to this day, a lot of the false doctrines in this world that arise up based upon Christianity, I think there was a Jew behind it. Because they hate the cross. It offends them. But... God's going to deliver them. Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith, not by works, 
By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. You see, faith always comes before obedience. If you believe what God said, you would do what God said. And he went uh, out not knowing whither he went. Verse 9, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. See, if you study this out, and you'll read that God showed up to Abraham, made him the promise, you're going to get this land, and your seed is going to be as the stars of heaven for number. And then he shows up to Isaac, makes the same promise. And then he shows up to Jacob, makes the exact same promise. And Jacob's going, uh, this is the gate of heaven. This is, I'm standing in the presence of God. Here's the gate of heaven. I want to call this place Bethel, the house of God. God made the same promise to Jacob and all of his seed. Now, part of this is important because you and I, even though we're Gentiles, we are adopted in to the family whom God said he would bless. And it wasn't Buddha's family. It wasn't Mohammed's family. It's not Confucius' family. It's not, I don't know what, there's 8 million gods that the Japanese worship. It's not their family. It's the family of Abraham. And you and I, even though we're Gentiles, we were adopted into it. Amen? So if God made those promises to Abraham and he intends to keep them, that means that we, if we also are children of Abraham by faith, we will receive those same promises. Which means now, if somebody curses you, God will curse them. And if somebody blesses you, God will bless them. Do you believe that? Have you ever seen that happen? Where somebody hated you and cursed you and then all of a sudden, boom, God got them for something? Have you ever seen that? I could tell you stories. Okay? So, look in verse um, 10. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. See, the land that he promised him was not just this dirt, soil, and rock there in, in the Middle East. It's Jerusalem above. That's what he promised him. Then verse 11, through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. Remember how old she was? 90 years old. Man. What do you think, Rose? <laughs> and you're not 90, are you? Can you imagine being 90 years old? And then you and Joe all of a sudden having a baby? Joe's going, ah! <laughs> Look at this, verse 12. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Why did God wait so long for to give Abraham and Sarah their child? To prove to them, it's not by your strength that I'm going to do this. It's by mine. And I believe Sarah conceived Isaac and gave birth to him and didn't have a problem in the world with it. God blessed her. Okay, so verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Remember what that phrase means? They're looking in the future and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now... They desire a better country, that is, and heavenly. Wherefore, God is, listen to this. God is not ashamed to be called their God. 
I mean, how often in the Bible it, does the Bible refer to God? I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Many times. Jesus himself even said, he's the God of the living, not God of the dead. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they're going to live again. And God is not ashamed to be called their God. Now listen to this. Anybody here, have you ever done anything really bad that you don't want to talk about, don't anybody know about, you don't want to bring up in church? Raise your hand. So tell us what it was. No. And yet God is not ashamed to be called your God. Did he not know what he was getting when he got you? Did he not know that, Brian? And yet, he's not ashamed of you. He's not ashamed of you. He's not ashamed of Sweetie Pie or Sister Betty or Brother Joe or me. Or, listen, I won't leave you out. Any of your... He's not ashamed of everybody, okay? Mick, he's not ashamed of you either. And man, I'll tell you what, you should have seen the Kenyans. When I'm preaching to them out in the country and I'm showing them how they are literally the temple of God from Revelation 4, they wept. Michael will tell you, they, they bowed before God on that day. These people who, living out in the middle of nowhere in Africa, that the world just doesn't have any mind of them at all, and yet they are the house of God. And God's not ashamed of them. God wasn't ashamed of sister, let me see, make, make sure I say this right, Aperit Maler was her name. God was not ashamed to be called her God. Amen? So you think God's going to keep his promise? If he lied to them, he's lied to us. And I don't believe God lies. Amen?